right, can you hear me? All right. So um, this is this was originally announced as a talk about Python with game programming or something, and then. Mozilla updated their Rust programming language um, to be more real-world useful, and I figured it might actually be an interesting idea to make a talk about this. Um, but I am normally a Python programmer, so I have a lot of like focus in the Python community for web stuff. Um, but I also did a little bit of a Ruby. Um, I kind of know how the language works with the interpreter. Uh, so I have some Ruby experience. Um, but what is Rust? Um, Rust is a new programming language by the guys from Mozilla. Um, but it's also a project very heavily under construction. Um, to give you an idea, the language just dropped support for classes, like proper classes, with the last release. They are changing keyword names around. So they changed ret to return, and a whole bunch of other things. So it's really, really strongly under construction. So um, it's not something you would make a program with at the moment. Um, but it does show some really interesting things you can do with the language. Um, or what you can do with programming languages going into the future. So um, this is Python code. Um, I guess all of you know what it does. It iterates over a list of names. Um, all these names are strings, and then it prints um, hello, name, um, nothing too spectacular. Uh, the same in Ruby looks like this. Um, so the difference here is you have an each method on the list, and you invoke this and pass it the block, and the block then executes every time a list item comes by. Now, can I see a show of hands, how many of you are doing Python? How many of you are doing Ruby? Uh, JavaScript? All right, so it seems like roughly 50-50 between Ruby and Python. So how many of you that know Python don't know Ruby? That is interesting. So the majority actually know both languages. That's, um, that's perfect. So. If you keep this in mind, this is how Python looks like. It's for something in a list, and this is Ruby, which is basically, you have an array, and then there is a method each on it, which is invoked for all these items. Going from there to Rust, it kind of looks like a combination of both. Um, so you have the for part, and then you have an each method on the list literal, and then the only thing that really changed from Ruby there is there was a keyword that was introduced, and then the arguments moved to the left side of the block, and this is actually a really clever idea, because that means it's parsable without doing any weird tricks in Alexa. So every time there is this like pipe symbol comes by, it knows, all right, it's either an operator or it's the start of a block. And depending on the context, it can unambiguously decide between those two. Um, and the other thing is that Rust is a compiled language, and it has types. It has really, really strong types. But you don't see any, like, this has to be a string or something. Um, it works because types are inferred in Rust. So the only time you actually have to define the types is if they are passed to a function. So you have to tell the function you're operating on this type. Um, and Rust also has pointers and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, for instance, this is a list of four integers, and then it invokes the map method, similar to Ruby. And there you see there are pointers involved because map, map basically puts the, um, passes the, uh, a pointer to that value instead of just the value. So instead of copying it, it says, all right, this is a pointer. So you have to dereference this by putting a star in front of it. Um, and again, no types. All of this is inferred. The let statement sees, all right, this is a list of strings because the return value of the map function was a string. So it, it's really not that far from programming Ruby or Python. It's, it still feels like a very dynamic language. Um, and going into the future, one thing that will be possible is instead of doing this dereferencing thing, you can also say, actually, I'm going to take a reference to x, and then you can just do x times x and convert it to a string. Um, so again, it, it, this is something that doesn't necessarily work right now. Um, this just basically changed this week to support it, and it's partially broken at the moment. Um, but it will eventually work. So one thing that's interesting of Rust is it tracks the lifetime of things. So um, in this case, it says, x is 42, and then y is a reference to x, a point to x. Um, but what's then interesting is it says set. It doesn't say set is y. It says the reference of set is y. So now you can use set as if it, the, the, the letter set as if it's the, uh, f, f is was x, and you can reassign this. And all of these are immutable. 
So you, you can't actually say X is 23. It will tell you I can't modify X because it's, in, it's an immutable storage. Um, compiling that is pretty simple. You just have this file, you compile it, dash G adds the debug symbols, and then you can run it. And this compile, like, you don't have to use any build tools like, um, I don't know, make or something. Uh, you can use it if you want, but the language in, in itself is enough ex, um, support for running, uh, invoking all the, to compile all the files that go together. So you, you can define what's called the create file that says this project depends of these files. And this, it works very much like Rust syntax itself does and compiles you everything together into one huge binary. So if this project would exist out of three files, I would have a create file that says this, there's an import for this, import for this, import for this, and you just have to compile the create file. And you get a ready-made program out of it. Um, so in a nutshell, what is Rust? It's immutable by default. So every time you want to make something that is modifiable, you have to put the mute keyboard in front of it. Um, it's statically typed, but all the types are locally inferred, so you don't actually have to specify the types for the most part. Um, there is no null pointer in the language. There is Every pointer has to point to something, and it's supported by the compiler from start to finish. Um, you will never have, unless there is a bug in the language, you will never have a segmentation fault because a pointer points to something that isn't true. And if you're saying this is like something you don't have a problem with in Python, uh, you will never have a nil uh, by accident, or you will never have uh, none type has no attribute something like you do in Python because the compiler ensures this will never happen. Uh, it has lightweight green threads as well as kernel level threads. Um, so you, concurrency is solved on the language level. It's not something that's added on top of the language like green letter in Python. And it's ahead of time compiled, but it also has a JIT compiler if you want to use it. And it also has soon uh, interactive shell where you can explore the language, um, which is interesting for compiled language. And it's fully C compatible, so you can already use it with OpenSSL or whatever C library you have. Uh, and one thing that's also pretty interesting, Rust needs a runtime, like uh, Ruby needs a runtime, or like Python needs a runtime, but that runtime is directly embedded into your executable. So you can just take this executable, ship it to any computer, and it runs. So it basically has the, the, the necessary parts integrated into the final executable. All right, let's look close at that example we had. Um, so it iterates over this thing and prints them out. So what's the for thing? Like, why do I have to have the for keyword here? And that's because this code can also be rewritten as this. So it passes, like, it takes, the each takes one argument, which is a function block, and then this function block returns true, and true means continue iterating. If you would return false there, it would say, um, I'm done iterating. It's like a break. Um, so this is basically just syntactic sugar for this. One thing you will notice here is like there is no semicolon at the end of that line. A missing semicolon at the end means uh, implicit return at value. Um, everything in Rust is an expression, similar to everything in, Rust, in Ruby is an expression. And if you ever uh, did some Ruby programming, you have probably noticed that sometimes functions return things by accident. Um, so for instance, you assign a local variable and then suddenly that return value is returned from the function just because there was the last expression. So if you look at the Ruby standard library, there are a whole bunch of functions where there's nil at the end just to make sure it doesn't return anything. In Rust, that problem is basically solved by if there is a semicolon at the end, there is no return value. If you leave out the semicolon, the last expression is returned. So this is a simple example for this. There is um, a list of three numbers in the first there's a semicolon, which means the return value of that function is nil. So you get the vector of three nils. Um, or if you return that number, then you get the vector of three numbers. Um, nil is like nil in Ruby or none in Python, and it's written as empty parentheses just for fun. There is some logic behind this, but I think it's slightly weird. All right, so there are no classes in, in Rust. Um, but you can do object-oriented ori programming if you want. And it works by a system called traits. And there's a whole bunch of like Haskell logic behind all of this. Um, but unlike Haskell, you don't have to be computer scientists to understand how the language works. So think of traits like interfaces in Java. You have a trait that says it's length printable or something. 
and it's a method that says print the length. There is no return value for this function. So you just define this somewhere, and then that's it. That's, that's the definition of what this trait is. It's not that different from modules in Ruby, so to say. Um, so that's here. Uh, then you need an implementation for this. This would be an example implementation. This reads a little bit funky. It says, there's an implementation that's parameterized on an arbitrary type T, which just basically means it works on any type. Uh, and it's defined for all references, which is the little m percent, to vectors of type T. Basically, it means every list, every reference to a list now gets a print length method on it of an arbitrary type. It doesn't matter. Uh, and then you define that function, and that the print's length is self.length. So what you can then do is like you do blah, 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 print length. So it's, it's similar to Ruby, so you can extend any type of the language, but it's locally scoped. So you have to have the trait in this trait implementation in your scope, or you have to have it imported. Otherwise, print length is not on there, uh, which is very nice, because it means you don't by accident have extension methods on your and the types that will clash with each other. The other thing is, which makes Rust really unique is memory ownership tracking. Um, Rust is a language without the garbage collector. You can have garbage collection on individual pointers, but you can write completely ungarbage collected code. And the way this works in the language is by tracking where memory moves. So here it says, let the name be Peter. And there's a small tilde in front of the string, which means there can only ever be one owner of that string. So if I say, let the new name be name, and then I try to print name. Um, so first of all, this will not work, because it will say, all right, there can only be one owner of this object. Um, and name has this, this string thing, it, and then you assign it to new name. It says, what's this? So you have to be explicit here. You can say, I want to move this over, um, in which case, this will not compile because it says the, va the, the, the value Peter was moved out of name. Um, you could copy it, then it say instead of move, copy, then you have this memory block copied, and it will compile again, or you just use the new, new variable. Also, one thing that's interesting, unlike many other statically typed languages, you can have the same variable, um, ha have a different type in the next line, because it will track statically what lifetime a variable has. So you could totally say name is 42, uh, let name be 42, and then let name be string, it will still compile. Uh, so it actually tracks how memory moves and how lifetimes work. So there are no null types. That's something really interesting. Um, so you need null in a way. Um, but how do you solve null if there is no null in the language? So first of all, where's the null here? Any ideas? Or none or nil? Yes, if there's an empty sequence, the return value is, is none. Um, so how do you solve this problem in Rust if there is no none? The answer is you return what's called an, an option. So you, this would be the same function. It says, there's a function first large that takes a sequence of integers and if another integer, which is the threshold value, and then it returns an option to an integer. And this actually still reads pretty much like English. You do if, for each item in a sequence, if the item is larger than x, return some item. And if you don't return anything, you return none. Um, so what you're actually doing here is you, you tag your return value by either being some integer or being none. Um, if you want to use this, you have to be explicit again. In this case, this is how you would invoke it. Like, get me a return value of this function, and then you print that return value, but you match on it. So match is like pattern matching. You do, it's like a switch statement with a whole bunch of bells and whistles. You match on a return value, and then if it's some number, then you say, found that number. Um, if it's none, then you don't have to do anything. You say, no number found. Um, so the solution is pattern matching. And it's, it's really amazing how well this works. Um, it's, it's nicely integrated in language. It feels like a switch statement. Um, and since everything is an expression, you can just return it. And this is basically supported by a system called enums. Um, but these are not C enums. 
you can have an enum that is one single value, like point, but every enum part can also have parameters, like a circle with a certain radius or a rectangle with certain dimensions. And then you can have an implementation of that enum. For instance, you can have a two-string method on it, which matches on self if it's a point, then if it's a point, if it's a circle of a specific size, then it prints that size, and so forth. Um, it's, it's really simple to use, despite the fact that there is a really expressive type system behind the language. Um, and the reason why the type system is really useful is, again, you will catch a lot of problems at compile time. For instance, if I add a new part to my enum and I don't update that method, it will not compile. It will tell me you're missing, you're missing whatever. But if, if I would add, I don't know, a quad here, then it will say there is no quad in this match statement. So you have to add it. It will never let me compile a code that would just implicitly do something. And then you can just print. You can say P is a point, C is a circle with uh, 4.0 radius, and then you can print this. Okay, so there are no classes either. Um, so how do you deal with not having classes? So traits are basically the solution here. You can have a structure as a point. It has two attributes. One is X, one is Y. Both of them are floats. And both of them are mutable. Because if I don't specify mute here, I will never be able to reassign the value once created. And then I have an implementation for that point. Um, here there's one static method on it that says um, it takes an x, it takes an y, and creates a point. It returns a point by value, so there's no pointer there. And then there is a single expression in it which basically creates an instance of that, uh, of that struct and returns it. So this is just something without methods right now. It has a, a constructor, but there is no real instance method on it. You can either add more instant methods in here, or you can also say, I want to spe implement a specific trait. For instance, you can implement a toString trait, which is a toStore method, uh, which is a pure function. Pure means it can't modify anything on the instance. Um, and then it returns a string, which is just in parentheses two floats, which is x and y. And then if you make uh, a main function that uses this, you just let p be the point uh, of the origin, so zero and zero, and then you can print it. Uh, what the two third trait basically means is that you can do some basic logic with it. You can say this function takes only things I can convert into string, and the, the thing knows how to convert into a string. All right, so how does inheritance work? Here's the interesting thing. It doesn't really. You can have trait inheritance. You can have like virtual methods, but all of your data is not inherited. So a subclass will not see the attributes at all. You have to expose these attributes through functions. Um, it takes a little bit getting used to, but there is a lot of logic in it. Um, it basically means you solve things through composition rather than through inheritance. There is a little bit of inheritance, but you, you don't use it as much as you would do in Python or Ruby. One other thing in Rust that is really quite cool is how the task system